I've had the pleasure of being at this podium for a few years, and now I have the pleasure of introducing, uh, shall I say, the next generation, though I know Antonio has been here before. So this is the younger generation, and um, uh, both of the people that I shall introduce have been with ASDIC and also uh, facilitating racial uh, equity collaborative right from its very beginning. So these, uh, their faces may be new to some of you, especially that of Tim Johnson, who has been usually sitting in the back there. I can usually look out and see Tim Johnson's shine, uh, I mean, uh, Tim Johnson's shiny face back there. And uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, these folks uh, who I will introduce have been with us for quite a long time. So there's, they're not at all new to the work uh, that we are about today. Uh, this year's conference theme is Overcoming Racism, Disruption as Usual, as Usual. In keeping with the conference themes, our two MCs, Antonio and Tim, are examples of people who are disruptors. Antonio Wilcoxon is currently the Community Relations Director for the Minnesota Department of Human Services. She is an organizational and systems disruptor who, by collaborating with communities and departmental staff, has created structural change. She has done this by deliberately creating a structure to bring in the voices of communities of color and explicit strategies for them to address and eliminate existing racial disparities in health and the human services system. Through training, she increases departmental staff awareness about the root of these disparities. She works with community members to increase their capacity to create community driven by policy and practice changes in order to improve outcomes for all. And my friend and colleague and in many areas mentor, uh, Tim Johnson, who is the retired pastor of Cherokee Park United Church, located in the west side neighborhood of St. Paul. He is a community disruptor and his impact on disrupting racism as usual can be seen in the congregation's commitment, I'm a member of that congregation, in the congregation's commitment to being an anti-racist organization. In 2008, this congregation organized a weekend of advanced training uh, in anti-racism. This was a conference, the very first conference of this sort that you are experiencing today. And this was the predecessor to the Facilitating Racial Equity Collaborative, FREC, which was created as a result of that initial conference that we had Victor Lewis as our keynote present, uh, presenter. With Tim's support, the congregation has continued to educate itself around issues affecting the Dakota people and other indigenous peoples. Hosted community educational and awareness events and participated in social justice activities supporting the Dakota people. Here are Antonia and Tim, very close friends to all of us. We welcome them as disruptors who will continue with this meeting as our MCs. Thank you. Good morning. A warm welcome to each and all of you. Welcome to the Facilitating Racial Equity Collaborative, or FRAC's eighth annual Overcoming Racism Conference. 
We are glad you are here to share in the history and learning of FRAC's two-day conference. My name is Antonia Wilcoxon, as uh, Kogiaman just generously introduced me, and... And so there's no confusion, I am Tim Johnson. <laughs> we are your FREC MCs for this conference, and it is our pleasure. We are grateful that this campus community and staff have been a continuing partner for the Overcoming Racism Conference for the past six years. It is our pleasure to welcome and introduce Jenny Arthur, President of Metropolitan State University, to share a few words of welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Metropolitan State. On behalf of our faculty, staff, and students, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our St. Paul location for this 2016 Overcoming Racism Conference of the Facilitating Racial Equity Collaborative. I am personally grateful to the committee for selecting Metropolitan State University as the host site for this important conference for the sixth year in a row. I especially want to recognize my predecessor, President Sue Hammersmith, for her leadership with FREC and in forging the relationship that first brought the Overcoming Racism uh, Conference to our campus. Dr. Hammersmith's visionary work during her presidency has provided a strong foundation for this partnership. Sue, will you please stand and be recognized? As many of you may already know, the mission and vision of Metropolitan State explicitly states our university's commitment to overcoming racism in our society through education and our engagement in and with our communities. We are a richly diverse community of learners and teachers, and all of us are both learners and teachers and we experience the creativity and strength that emerges when all of us are able to fully participate in this educational endeavor and remain learn open to learning from each other. One of the most hopeful signs that I see that we might be able to achieve our collective vision of an equitable and just society is that when I go out and talk with students they often tell me that one of the great values of a Metropolitan State University education is the opportunity to learn in classrooms where a wide variety of life experiences and cultures is represented and participating, and where they're encouraged by their faculty members and their classmates to share perspectives on pressing questions facing our world. Our students know the value of learning from each other and are going to be well prepared for creating and thriving in diverse, inclusive, and equitable workplaces and communities. As I reviewed the conference program, I was impressed by the wide array of topics and presenters and the focus on changing systems that continue to oppress and that so distrust between all of us. We need to resist those forces that divide us because if we are united, those systems cannot stand. I thank each and every one of you for your determination and perseverance. The change we seek is not easy and we see the ugliness of the response when we begin to have an impact on damaging those awful social structures. I hope that on our campus over the next two days, you will find the welcoming and open atmosphere that creates the safe spaces we all need 
to explore ideas, discuss difficult and painful issues, and experience the learning and personal growth necessary to achieving our goals. May you have a meaningful experience. I hope you leave renewed and ready to continue this critical work. Thank you. Thank you, President Jeannie Arthur, for your welcoming words and the generous partnership we enjoy with this university staff and the community with FREC's annual Overcoming Racism Conference. While we are here, we wish to recognize the passing of one of the founding members of FRAC. A few months ago, we lost Marjorie Otto to cancer. Tim and I worked closely with Marjorie from the very beginning of this conference. Marjorie is one of the co-founders of this effort alongside Okogieman and many others. Marjorie was a woman raised in the South, touched and touched many of our lives in her stoic and courageous example of how to be a model disruptor. I miss Marjorie today. This conference started in the basement of Cherokee Park United Church, where now retired Pastor Tim Johnson led his congregation committed to anti-racism work. I count myself fortunate to be part of this committed group of people devoted to creating the beloved community. I want you to know that Tim was there from the start of this conference and of FRAC. So Tim, would you please share a synopsis of the history of the facilitating racial equity collaborative and at this time, I invite all FRAC members listed on page 27 to please stand, if you can, if you're able. The story of FRAC, we call this our eighth annual conference, but in fact it is our ninth. Here is the story behind the math. Uh, you see the graphic on page five. The story of FREC begins with the 2008 gathering hosted by ASDEC Metamorphosis and the Cherokee Park United Church anti-racism team at Cherokee Park United Church on the west side in St. Paul. The purpose of the two-day event was to provide advanced training for anti-racism facilitators. In 2009, an expanded organizing group took on the name FREC, Facilitating Racial Equity Collaborative. From the beginning, we understood FREC to be a learning community with conference attendees as our fellow learners. Initially, the primary audience included trained facilitators, educators, and activists. Since then, we have expanded our intended audience to include all who are engaged in anti-racism work with individuals, organizations, and communities. FRAC members include organizations, institutions, and their representatives, as well as unaffiliated individuals from within the community. FREC has become a community with a unique culture and identity, remaining true to our origins and sense of mission. We continue to be identified with practices of facilitation and transformation. Today, FRAC is a dedicated collective of organizations, organizations and individuals committed to overcoming racism in Minnesota. Our collective mission is to work against structural racism and racial disparities. We are an anti-racism organization. With all of you, the Overcoming Racism Conference is another opportunity to speak and hear the truth of our history and our experiences, to continue the learning and to facilitate social transformation together. Please note the learning objectives on page four. 
Everyone is welcome to join us for our monthly planning meetings held on the second Thursday of each month from 9 to 11 at the Wilder Foundation on Lexington Parkway in St. Paul. The more of you who join with us, the more that we can do together. Welcome. Today, the Facilitating Racial Equity Collaborative, or FRAC, now convenes the eighth annual Overcoming Racism Conference. This year's conference theme is Disrupt Racism as Usual. Too many people feel powerless and need specific ideas and encouragement to act. Some might get paralyzed by fear, equating disrupting with violence. This conference will empower participants to understand how, to disrupt, how they disrupt racism in ways that make sense in the context of their own lives. It will give people concrete ways to disrupt racism in our communities, our institutions, and ourselves, along with the context of why we need to disrupt racism and inspiration for action. In 2016, Minnesota again joined an infamous list of states in which unarmed African Americans have been killed at the hands of police. As organizers of this Overcoming Racism Conference, FRAC members are painfully aware that police shootings are only one of the many ways in which racism leads to early and premature death for indigenous people and all people of color. Stress from racist structures and daily microaggressions, uneven health care, and a loss, a host of inequities, all contribute to early loss of life. Today we wish to honor with a minute of silence those during the past year who have been lost to us from the evils of racism. Into the silence, I will mention the name of Philando Castillo, and I invite you to name aloud any who have died this year in full or in part because of racism. The silence will be broken by a dramatic reading taken from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Birmingham jail letter to white clergy. Please join me in silence, and in the silence, speak the names of any you would wish to remember, who in 2016 found their lives cut short by racism. Philando Castillo. We, the undersigned clergymen, are among those who, in January, issued an appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with the racial problems in Alabama. We expressed understanding that honest convictions in racial matters could properly be pursued in the courts, but urged that decisions of the courts should, in the meantime, be peacefully obeyed. Since that time, there has been some evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts. Responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which cause racial friction and unrest. In Birmingham, recent public events have given indication that we all have opportunity for a new, constructive, and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. We agree, rather, with certain local Negro leadership who have called for honest and open negotiation of racial issues in our area. And we believe this kind of facing of issues can best be accomplished by citizens of our own metropolitan area, white, 
and Negro, meeting with their knowledge and experience of the local situation. All of us need to face that responsibility and find proper channels for its accomplishment. Just as we formerly pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political tradition, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement officials in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should these demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. We further strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. As in so many past experiences, our hopes had been blasted and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and the national community. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You're quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. We know through painful experience 
that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. First, I must, must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. I had also hoped that the white moderate would reject the myth concerning time in relation to the struggle for freedom. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than have the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr.